Okay, and we are on. So, this is where we left off, but we're done, so moving on. Today we're going to talk a little bit about a lot of technical details. And then Friday will be about acid principles. So once we hit acid principles, we're done. So, user control, right? The most direct method for matching feed content to preferences is going to ask the users what they want. Say, what sort of content would you like to see on Facebook? Okay? But this is actually difficult. Number one, you don't want to give people a list of 10,000 different options that they all have to individually check on or off. That's a hassle. Number two, you might only be interested in a small niche of a large topic. For example, I have a cousin. His name is Brock Lundquist. Let's see what he's doing. Brock Lundquist, he's a fine young man, and he plays baseball. If I can get Google to up and run. Networks, damn it. Okay, I'll try again. I'll try again on a new tab. Anyway, Brock Lundquist plays baseball, and he is trying to get in on the Toronto Blue Jays. And last I checked, I think he was uh, 2A, so he might do it, he might not. He already got his signing bonus, whatever. Damn. So the computers don't want to work today. Nothing wants to work. Well, short version is, maybe we'll get this eventually. I was going to pop him up there, but I guess it's not cooperating. Anyway, I'm not really that interested in baseball. I mean, I'll watch the Cubs if they make it to the playoffs, and I'll, you know, drink more than usual if they make it to the World Series. Uh, but I, American League, you know, that, that's deviant baseball. That hardly should even be called baseball because that whole designated hitter thing. And, of course, you know, I have no personal affiliation with the Toronto Blue Jays. I mean, wish them well and all, but don't really care. But if my uh, cousin Brock ends up in their starting lineup, that would be awesome, and I would probably watch a whole bunch of Toronto Blue Jays games, and I would want to know about them, right? So... Not really that interested in, I mean, I'm mildly interested in baseball, but I'm very interested in his connection with baseball. But Facebook is not going to have a tab for whether I am interested in seeing Brock Lundquist playing baseball. It's just not going to do it. Last, imprecise post tagging. So any topic you come up with, right, the way you would match, you would try to identify this post corresponds to these topics. But there's always going to be some error, some imprecision in that kind of process. Because you don't, again, you don't want to have a list of 10,000 different tags, everything that might conceivably refer to this post, and then try to have it, uh, you know, accurately assess how closely it affiliates with it. So anyway, this uh, whole user uh, input model, it maybe sounds nice, but the actual process of implementing it in any kind of detailed system is actually not really that good of an idea. Okay, next thing, presentation. So, mobile devices, desktop applications, the way the apps run, the way they look, they're very different. So, desktop applications, large screen size, so there's more real estate, there's more space on the screen, you can show a lot of stuff, right? For example, if for Facebook, you have a lot of room to show ads around the peripheral uh, areas of the screen. Mobile device, you don't, right? You might use pop in one big ad that blocks everything until somebody watches some of it, but you're not going to have that much space for ads around the side. Second thing, landscape, right? So a desktop, you're going to have a screen that's like this, right? It's going to be wide. Mobile device, most of the time, it's going to be tall and relatively thin. It's going to be a portrait orientation. Desktops tend to have vastly more local storage and computing power, right? If you want to do anything that involves a lot of data, Right, that you're actually going to keep, you probably want to do that on a desktop. And generally, it's much easier to do user input. So, for example, in theory, you could use Excel or you know write a term paper in Microsoft Word on a small mobile device, but you really wouldn't want to, right? You would prefer that bigger keyboard, bigger screen, all of that. So, same application structure is probably not going to give a good experience to both mobile and desktop users, right? You have to adapt the application to the context. One of the common things for doing that is what's called responsive or uh, adaptive sizing, right? So auto sizing the screen as necessary. So mobile devices have smaller screens and desktops, so they have to prioritize visible content, right? Even that, even saying that, mobile devices aren't anything like homogenous. They're all different kinds. There are small smartphones with relatively small pixels counts. There are small smartphones with very large pixel counts. There are tablets with a variety of pixel counts, and there are laptops with potentially very large pixel counts. 
And any of those, you know, you can run in different graphical modes anyway. So what you want to do in most cases is design the application windows to automatically scale to whatever the device is. So part of the, uh, let's see, can I, can I even get to this today? I hope they didn't drop me from the, I'm going to check something. Because we had this happen before where I, uh, I got totally dropped from uh, the ACCC account. I'm going to draw a picture of see, We have this. Let's see. I get that? No, I, I don't know. Some shit's wrong with the network today. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a picture. So, if you have Facebook on a desktop or on a mobile device, you're going to, in some sense, see the same thing. So what goes in the middle, right, is going to be the feed. And you might see some other stuff. You might see some ads. Uh, you might see some helpful links, right, to things like, you know, Facebook tools or groups or games, whatever. Now, on a desktop, you're going to be able to see all of those. It's this fucking thing again. Okay. This is not my day. This whole thing is... is yeah. Well, I guess I gotta live with it. Okay. So try to do this again. Good help good help is hard to find. Okay. I'm just gonna talk about it then. So in Facebook, on a desktop, you can show all those things, right? You can show the feed in the middle, you can show the ads off to one side, you can show the links off on the other side, and there's room to display them all. In a mobile device, there probably isn't. So what happens is, Facebook figures, ah, the feed, that's the thing we want to see. So we're gonna verify that there's enough space for the feed, we're gonna fit the feed to whatever pixel coordinates your device allows. And then for the other things, we're going to include tabs up in the corner, right? There'll be like a little thing with a few uh, horizontal lines. You click on that, and that'll get you to a menu of other options. So all those things are still there. It's just because of space constraints, you're not going to be able to see them all on the screen all at once. Now, if I can get this going, I probably can't. This is frustrating. Yeah, the problem is Microsoft puts all this shit on your computer and that you can't see the, uh, the headaches I have going on. Microsoft puts all this shit on your computer and then when it can't get the connection it wants to have, then you see all that little bouncing of all the icons in the corner that you can't really see. But I can, this here, this endless bouncing. Oh, there, hey, we got it. Okay, so good. I have some network capability now. Okay, good. So, difference between responsive and adaptive design. So there's two different ways that you can manifest this. One, okay, you have a responsive container. So this container is 603, right, so many pixels wide. All right. Look at the first one. Responsive one, responsive one scales smoothly. See that? It says responsive, it does that. As long as there's space available, right, it's gonna try to scale it down. And it can scale down pretty small, but you can set some minimum size on it. Okay, the other one down below, this is an adaptive container. It's 800 pixels wide if the browser is at least 500 pixels wide. Otherwise, it snaps down to 300. So you'll see when I shrink this, it very suddenly does not do what it's supposed to, right? That's what makes this article funny. However, that's the way a responsive container is supposed to work. It's supposed to snap into place. But what does actually work that way on this page are the ads. So, if there's space enough for the ads, if the ads are so wide, or if the screen is so wide I see them, but once the screen size shrinks beyond a certain point, the ads vanish, okay? They just snap out of visibility altogether. That's what responsive is. So again, when I first uh, started using this page as an example, it worked properly, but since then the uh, adaptive one has actually become responsive even though they didn't change the label on it. But the ads, the ads are, uh, the ads are adaptive. Okay, now you don't need to know for purposes of the exam, I'm not going to ask you the difference between responsive and adaptive. 
it's one of those, it's a simple thing, but it's kind of hard to remember because, you know, it's not obvious in the name. What it is, they're just two techniques for controlling that the stuff you see on the screen is appropriate for what you actually uh, have available on your device. So, all the features are ultimately accessible on any device, that's the goal. So if you're using Facebook, you can still get to all the same stuff on any device. And what you'll do, you'll look at the minimum size. So the minimum size that Facebook is gonna run on is enough to show the feed in some kind of vertical uh, you know, swipe arrangement. And then, other things, if you don't have room for them on the main screen, Facebook is going to set up menus whereby you can access them. Okay. Following that, ads, okay? Because mobile devices have small screens, they typically display far fewer ads. You know, you go to Facebook, yeah, there's probably a bunch of ads in the margin, right? You go to Yahoo Finance, there's a bunch of ads in the margin for, uh, for a desktop. Mobile device, probably not so much. Because... On a desktop, typically ads don't interfere with the application use, right? There's plenty of space available to do stuff on Facebook. It's just they pack some ads in the margins. Mobile device ads, though, they do tend to interfere with uh, application use, right? So you know if you're watching YouTube, right, the screen, the video screen basically fills up the whole window. And if that ad starts playing, ah, that's, you know, that's all you can see is the ad. You have to get through it. And if you're using a desktop, you have the same structure, right? The ad is still going to block the video, but if you want to leave a comment or do some other stuff on the page, you still can. It's pretty easy. So, for mobile devices, users typically have to scroll past ads or click on them or wait for them to time out. So, you're not going to see as many ads, but mobile devices, do. it does tend to enforce a, uh, you know, greater engagement with them. And, of course, Facebook integrates ads, regardless of whether you're using a desktop or a mobile device, it integrates them into their feeds, and uh, both product ads and clickbait. Okay, so what's clickbait? We know what clickbait is, right? If uh, when I was much, well, I don't even know what year the quote was from, but probably from the '60s. There was a Supreme Court uh, justice when they asked him what point, you know, to define pornography, and he says, "Well, I can't give you a good definition, but I know what it is when I see it." It's the same thing with clickbait, right? It's a little tough to come up with a definite definition, but we know what clickbait is, right? They're trying to get you to click something. They're going to overhype whatever they're selling. So, key elements, enticing headline or link. You're like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. I, I, I want to click, right? Number two, quite often users have to click through a whole bunch of screens to reach the content, right? So, what is a what is a typical typical click, clickbait link? What's that? Okay, that could be one, right? So yeah, uh, buy a new house with no money down, right? Or uh, learn how to trade options in your free time, whatever. Uh, what else? Okay, what is something that would transform well into a whole bunch of screens? A guy that flips houses using someone else's money and you have to, there's only one step third. Yeah, you could do that. The one I was hoping to, those are all perfectly good examples of clickbait. The one I wanted to hear was something like, 12 reasons why your girlfriend hates you. You won't believe number six, right? Yeah, and then you, you click through them, okay? Yeah. Okay, so we can, you know, and you can find stuff. You don't even have to look that hard to find these things. Hey, my internet's better, hooray, okay? Okay, now that you guys... This is Brock. He's real. He plays, he's on Major League. We get an image for him. He has a crazy mustache, right? He's gone through different stages with that. Anyway. But yeah, he's trying to play for Toronto. It'd be great if he makes it. All right. Anyway, if any of you are baseball people and you happen to be watching a Toronto Blue Jays fan, and, you know, X years down in the future, you happen to see him in the lineup, you're like, holy shit, I don't yeah. Okay. But we'll see what happens. Anyway, clickbait. So... Uh, 12 reasons why your girlfriend is dumping you. Ah, 75 reasons she dumped you. That's impressive. I mean, I think for me, you could come up with 75, but yeah. All right. That's good. Okay, so we, we get what clickbait is. Now, how does clickbait make money? Well... Same as any other online ad, right? The point of a clickbait system is 
it sounds good, you click on it, you get to a page where there's a bunch of ads, and hopefully you click on one of the other ads. In some cases, they might even get referral traffic paid. I mean, it's gonna be much smaller, but if you click on from one clickbait article to another, you might, they might get some kind of referral kickback money for that, okay? So that's how clickbait makes money. That's why it exists. You wanna see something funny? You'll have to trust me that it's funny. So you guys have seen Star Wars, right? I'm actually old enough to have seen Star Wars in the theater in its first run. Wow. I fell asleep through it, though, because I was a little kid and they took me out in the nighttime thing. Anyway, Star Wars... Head bump. If you don't know about this, now you learn. Okay, watch it. I'm going to blow it up. Watch their heads. <laughs> One more time in case people missed it. <laughs> That's so awesome that it's in the movie. Now next time you see it, you'll know to watch for that. Okay. And look, clickbait. Ten Star Wars movie mistakes you missed. Okay. So it exists everywhere. But yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. Okay. So, I mean, at least you learned that. All right. Now we'll talk about technical system elements. So those are some things, you know, that Facebook is aware of, how it sets up the application, how it displays it, the kind of ad models that go in. All right. But we'll talk about uh, content management and cloud, and that'll be the day. Okay. So what is a content management system? Well... You might guess something about content and something about managing it, right? And it's all brought together in a system. Yeah. So, number one, you have a content management application. So those are all your tools for adding, changing, deleting content. In the context of Facebook for a lot of people, that's uploading photos, right? You add content by uploading photos. You can edit them. You really can't, but not, Facebook doesn't make sense to edit a photo. But you could do it in terms of posts, right? If you t uh, type up something and then later you're like, wow, that was really stupid. Let me make it sound better. And then you do that. And you can delete stuff, right? You can drop photos. You can cancel comments, whatever. Okay? That's content management. That's the application. And in Facebook, it's a cluster of related applications. The other is the content delivery application. And all that are your tools for permission-based content distribution. So the idea is not everybody gets to see everything. There are limits. In Facebook, it's generally your friends get to see most things that you post. You can specify subsets of friends. You could specify a post as being totally public, and then the whole world can see it. But then you get all the spam bots wanting to make contact with you and add you as friends and stuff. So it's not that good of an idea, right? So generally in Facebook, the primary uh, permission model is your friends can see it. But there are alternatives. Now, Facebook feed is basically a semi-public content management system. So, users, businesses, Facebook itself, they can all inject content, right? Your friends put content into Facebook, businesses have their pages. Uh, Facebook itself, they want to notify you of some change to a Facebook policy, they can put that in, okay? And the content delivery is based on these user influence rules for visibility and preferences, right? So you don't have total control over them, but you do have influence. For example, you can specify that all of your friends see an image, but in reality, because of the vast number of people on Facebook and the level of traffic, not all users are going to see everything posted by every other user, right? So unless you're pretty good friends, you're not gonna see it. Most people, only about you know 10 or 20% of their friends actually see the stuff they post on Facebook. Other times it doesn't make it into their feed. They could go down and scroll down through everything if they had time, and then yeah, they'd eventually see it. But this is why I say there are user influence rules. So you can control who can't see it, and you can control who could see it. You don't have a lot of control over who does see it, okay? All right, other stuff, there was actually a little bit of, uh, you know, there, were, there was a thing in 2016, Facebook staff, uh, basically right-leaning content, they were, insiders in Facebook were actually deliberately downgrading it. So you know they had this uh, feature for trending articles. 
So this isn't conspiracy stuff. This is from the Washington Post and the Facebook people said, yeah, we did this. So Facebook internally, the kind of content that some of their people want to exclude, yeah, that got excluded. So you can influence the rules. The users don't control them. Okay. Content management system. So Facebook is basically a world scale, you know, a global scale content management system. That's what it does. It stores content and it distributes it according to those permission based rules. And so if you were going to define, you know, Facebook, that would be one perfectly valid way to do it, right? It's a global scale cloud based con uh, content management system. So even if all your data is static, just maintaining that large amount of data that's a whole big deal, right? You have to ensure that all the users can get to it, right? So with some of the stuff we talked about, different memory models and integration of RAM and hard drives for storage so that the stuff people want to see is actually available to see and you don't have like long lines forming to particular hard drives to try to get it. The other thing is planning for growth, right? Facebook's growth, they're adding, you know, probably an exabyte or so of photos every year. It is a lot of data. They have to manage that. But on top of that, it's not even that simple for Facebook. Even that huge big problem, Facebook's challenges are significantly worse because the data is largely dynamic. And it's dynamic in the sense that, number one, they, Facebook wants to show people the most recent data in the feed, right? And there's a constant changing over. What was most recent yesterday is no longer most recent today. So Facebook has to keep on refreshing everything. It's not a simple storage and retrieval system. It's storage and retrieval and prioritization and deciding on what constitutes hot data and what constitutes cold data based on user actions. Okay. Also, all these real-time updates, right? Facebook has to post and process all of the user comments on everything pretty much in real time and edits to comments in pretty much real time. And last, changes in access and friendship, right? They don't change that often, right? Once, you know, there's an initial window where we join Facebook and we get a bunch of friends. But after that, it's fairly stable. But still, different content, you could change the uh, visibility of that. And you could make some people friends and unfriend other people. It changes, okay? So it's, it's a pretty complicated thing. Now... Talking about caching and replication. Remember, caching, storing data where it's easy and fast to get to. Replication, making copies of the data. So, the worst case for Facebook network is where there's some content that's very popular and very bandwidth intensive. Right? It uses, requires a lot of space in the network to transmit. So, things like celebrity interviews, right? Uh, somebody does like a live streaming concert, or they have some interview, you know, somebody who's big and famous and they have an interview and everybody wants to tune in and see what they have to say, okay? Video clips from a big sporting event like the Super Bowl happens or the World Series, some other stuff, uh, you know, NBA finals, whatever. Uh, video clips from that, a lot of people are gonna tune in to watch. The good thing though, most viewers aren't gonna watch content live as it happens, they're gonna be staggered over time. So, you know, every minute or so, a new batch of users will tune in to start watching. So you don't have everybody watching the exact same stuff. That makes it a little easier. So, two-part solution. Number one, caching, right? If it's very popular content, you make it easy to reach. So, for example, videos that you want to deliver quickly, you store the segments of the videos in RAM so that they're very quick to, you know, to retrieve, unlike from hard drives. Number two, replication. So any of those video segments, they not only get replicated to servers or uh, you know delivery systems around the uh, world, they get uh, delivered to copy to multiple ones. So you can, uh, if you have a very very popular uh, video, one that's so popular that even RAM, uh, a standard single copy of RAM can't uh, cover it all. Well, guess what? You can just make duplicate copies. You can have separate banks of RAM and store another copy in another bank of RAM. Okay, and that prevents the bottleneck. At the at you know one particular server, so you can always make more copies of things to allow users to have parallel access. Now, of course, even Facebook, big as they are, they do have their limits. So, if everybody in the world tuned in at exactly the same time to watch the very same video, it'd be a little bit difficult. But something about this. Uh, there's something called multicast. This I won't cover in on the lecture, but if you're just, I mean, I won't cover it on the exam. But 
Suppose Facebook has one machine and all of this goes through different machines, right? Different routing equipment, switches, whatever, to reach a whole bunch of end users, right? So let's say each one of these endpoints here is a large number of users, say, you know, a thousand users per endpoint. If Facebook sent every packet of every video as a separate transmission, like a secure email to each one of those users, that would be a really, 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 really large amount of data, right? That would be, in this case, what, like 9,000 copies of the video getting sent, which would probably eat up most of the network capacity. But what they can do is something called multicast. So multicast means one copy per network, essentially. So instead of sending a thousand separate copies to each of these endpoints, instead Facebook says, well, if you guys want to watch this, this video is going to be distributed via multicast. The end users register to watch it as a multicast stream. And then when Facebook sends it out, it says, okay, I'm going to send one copy here. This device will forward one copy to each of these endpoints but it'll send it to every device at that endpoint. So it doesn't create that much of a bottleneck up here or even down here because you're still ultimately only sending one copy, you know, until you get to the level of the individual users themselves. So multicast is a way that they can also manage this traffic, but it's a bit, you know, techy for this. But if you hear about multicast in video streaming, that's what that is essentially. You have one copy of a video segment and you share it over a whole bunch of downstream users. Okay. Uh, okay. Last topic, as I recall, cloud. So we'll do a very quick intro to cloud. We will eventually get like a whole lecture about cloud, but we're going to talk about what it is now. So we know Facebook has way too much data to store on a single hard drive or a single computer in its RAM. Okay. Facebook has simultaneous connections from millions of users. You're not going to manage that on one single device either. Massive read write requirements. And what about reliability? You have to have backup machines. You have to have backup storage. Okay, multiple copies of data. Just not going to do it. So, solution is a cloud system. Okay, so what a cloud system means, basically in terms of user experience, you're over here, the cloud is over there, you send stuff to the cloud, and that's all you need to know. The cloud handles it, right? It's like you drop, uh, mo you drop money into an ATM to do a deposit. A bunch of stuff happens that you don't need to know about, but you know the system works. That's essentially what it is in Facebook. So from the user experience, it's wonderful. We don't need to know anything about what goes on in that cloud. We just need to say, well, I uploaded my photo to it, and it'll be there when I need it. Great. Okay. So... Cloud details get hidden from users for security and ease of use, and operational requirements, how the cloud works, get broken up into segments and allocated to computers. So what you have, somewhere in the cloud, you have a bunch of different copies of everything running on different machines, but to the outside, it appears as there's just one interface through the Facebook.com website. Okay. So, we'll do a quick picture. Here you, on the left, you have a bunch of stick figures doing things. There's a couple of them, top and bottom, doing HTML, doing web browsing. There's one in the middle doing webmail. Da, da, da. There's some network over here. This is the site, right? This globe in the www, that's the cloud website. So that would be facebook.com. You go there. Everything to the right of the site, that's the Facebook operation itself. So there's a firewall. These days, load balancers aren't standalone equipment, really, so this is kind of an old picture. But there is some load balancing function in there that assigns different connections to different cloud instances. And a cloud instance is basically a group of servers working together. So Facebook says to a particular user, oh, you're Joe. Well, Joe, your data is stored on this machine that's part of this cloud instance. We're going to connect you to that machine. And so to Joe, it just looks like he's connecting to Facebook, but Facebook knows that any time a request comes in from Joe to see something, it connects him to the proper cloud instance, and any time it's sending something out from that cloud instance, going to Joe. Okay? Facebook manages all those details, but to Joe, all he knows, his browser connects to Facebook, and he's good. 
Okay. So, what is the cloud? Well, a server network, right? So you have a bunch of servers in the, you know, the back of Facebook somewhere. There's a shared interface. Everybody goes to facebook.com. That's but what we mean by that. So one single user interface point. Load balancing to allocate new connections. And then backup systems. So everything you have in Facebook, there are copies available. And if uh, certain applications go down, you can pretty seamlessly connect people from one copy of the application to another. Other features, cloud systems tend to be geographically distributed, right? You don't put all your servers in one building because if something happens to that building, that's the end of it. So Facebook in particular, Facebook, Google, the other big ones, they have data centers all around the world. And cloud networks tend to need elevated security because you have what's called uh, multi-tenant access. So in most cases, any of these servers, right, the storage on them, there could be data from a whole bunch of different users, right? Which is different from you log into your machine and only you are using your machine. So because you have a lot of users sharing the same memory space, they have to be pretty uh, security conscious. And at this point, any cloud services that weren't security conscious are pretty much gone by now. So, you know, just a natural process of evolution, the ones that are good at security tended to survive. Okay. So what is a server? Well, let's talk about the details of this stuff. Well, a server is simply a computer that delivers requested content to network users. Right? So it serves up the data. Typically, it's going to be an intermediary between a database system and the system user. So you have what are called application servers that run the applications like on Facebook. So when somebody asks, hey, show me this picture, the application server probably doesn't have that picture stored. It calls the database and says, hey, this user who has authorization to get it wants to get this picture, and the database sends it to the server, and the server serves it to you. Okay? In principle, any networked computer could function as a server. So if you use something like, has anybody ever used BitTorrent? I hear BitTorrent is coming back. Bit, no, yes? Nobody's, yeah, come on, okay. BitTorrent is primarily a tool for copyright violation, right? So if you're not paying to see it on Netflix, you can you know, get it through BitTorrent. Uh, and in that case, you have a whole bunch of computers that are peers, so you can act as clients and servers at the same time. You can be a server for some kinds of data, you can be a client to pull others. Okay, so in principle, any computer that can deliver data could function as a server, but when we talk about servers in the cloud, there are these big, expensive, you know, super powerful machines that can handle hundreds or thousands of simultaneous connections, right? They're machines that are specifically designed to serve in this kind of high capacity server role. So, yeah, any machine, any network computer could be a server, but when we talk about cloud servers, there's an expectation that they'll, they'll be generally much more powerful than the client machines. Okay. So, in practice, servers are more powerful. Uh, they can handle lots of parallel operations for multiple client users, so they typically have many cores. And then there are two models, thin versus thick, for both client and applications. So, let's see, do we talk? Yeah, we talk about this, so I skip ahead a little bit. Okay, we'll, talk, we'll come back to that. So, what's running on these cloud servers are a bunch of applications running in parallel. So you have a whole bunch of different copies typically of the same application running on one server. So for any particular application, you'll generally pick one server or one group of servers to run it. And primary reason why, big reason why, is security and quality of service management. So I'll just give a little bit of insight into the security problem. So suppose this is a road. Okay, this is a road and it's got two lanes. And there's a bunch of different cars going by on the road. Some of them are black, some of them are purple. Some of them are brown. And I don't know, some of them are dark blue. Okay? And even though they're different colors, different people using the applications in different ways, these colors are pretty similar. So if something comes along that's like, let's see what really stands out, orange? Orange stands out pretty well. Red stands out pretty well, right? So if something happens that's a little bit fishy, these things, they're going to be pretty easy to spot. If I say, which one is the red car, right? You're going to be like, 
Oh, that's the one. Which one's the orange car? That one. It's really going to stick out. Okay, and if I colored all these up as like just black and brown, it'd be really obvious. However, if all these cars have a rainbow of colors, then it's going to be a lot more difficult, right? If there's thousands of different colors of cars on the road, and I say, okay, find the red one, and you're like, well, that car, you know, that looks pretty close to red. It's orange, right? And this one, if I, if all the cars are like either orange, and it's just total chaos, there's a lot of different... Uh, colors on there, like different applications running, it can be difficult to get the particular one that stands out, okay? I'm doing a, not a very good job of mixing up the colors here. But you see, it's just, the red doesn't stand out quite as well, it's not as different. And the basic way security works is you have some kind of baseline for what expected uh, normal system behavior should be, and anything that deviates strongly from that, you say, oh, that's something we should check out. So number one, if you're running all the same kind of application on one set of servers, it makes it easier to monitor that set of servers because it's more of an apples to apples, single baseline kind of comparison. The other thing, in terms of quality of service. So quality of service basically means how well the networked application is running. And if you have, for example, suppose you have, I don't know, 100 people using Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is not terribly data intensive in most cases. But then if you had another person doing web browsing, maybe that's going to add on a little bit of traffic because they're just, uh, you know, looking at text web pages. But maybe they go to YouTube and watch a bunch of streaming video, in which case that one user is really going to throw off, you know, is going to probably outweigh all those other hundred Microsoft Word users. So if everybody's using the same kind of application, then it's relatively easy to compare. You say, oh, I have 50 users now. If I add on 10 more users, that's probably going to increase the data requirements by about 20%. Whereas if they're all using different applications, you could throw in a few heavy users doing, again, video streaming, high-quality video. That's the real killer. That could really throw off all your numbers. Okay? So if everybody's using the same kind of uh, application, you can generally say with some confidence, if I prorate the number of users, I'm going to equally, you know, increase the amount of capacity required. Okay. And again, yeah, new, uh, new connections. When some user shows up and says, hey, I'm trying to connect to Facebook, Facebook is going to look at which servers are available and connect them to one of them. And some of the things it looks at is basically how busy all the servers are, what kind of applications are running on them. When groups of servers start to get a little too busy, Facebook will bring some new ones online. Plus, Facebook has a pretty uh, good, you know, idea of what times of day are busy and what times aren't, and it regularly plans to bring on and off new groups of servers. And it's going to look at... Uh, utilization through all these uh, parts. So not just from the client to the server, but also from the servers to the database, because you could have uh, very different uh, consequences there. For example, if the server wants to pull a bunch of data from the database, but then it processes it and it delivers it to the user in a relatively compact form, you might have a lot of traffic on the back end from the application servers to the database, but relatively little from the application servers to the client. Of course, you could also have a program where you're interacting frequently with the application server, but the application server basically never has to pull data beyond the first case, right? So it pulls data once, then it doesn't have to worry anymore. Most of the traffic happens between the client and the application server. So there's different parts of the network where the traffic could be a, you know, a bit of a bottleneck, and they look at all that when they determine how to connect new users to new servers and which servers to bring on. Okay. So this is the last slide. We're getting close to the end. Thin versus thick model. So for clients, you can talk about thin machines or thick machines. So a thin machine means it's relatively weak. Uh, the extreme case would be just a terminal with uh, a user interface, but not any permanent storage, right? Maybe thinking like uh, an ATM machine. There's not a whole lot going on there other than the connection to the banking operation. In a thick client, Client machines are relatively powerful, like, for example, a complete desktop, right? It has a lot of application running power, has a lot of storage capacity, right? Pretty good for that. So clients can be thick, in which case they basically, they can't do much by themselves, meaning they have to rely on other components in the network to do it, or thick machines, meaning they can do a lot by themselves. 
Applications, likewise, a thin application means it works primarily, it relies primarily on other machines to do the work. So processing in that case would mostly happen on the server, the application server, not on the client machine. And then the results would be returned over the network. So, you know, if you have a big Excel file and it's a thin application, that means the server is actually running this big Excel file and doing all this stuff to it. The client machine just sees the interface, just sees the results of it. Okay? However, you can also have a thick application. And in a thick application, the processing mostly happens on the client. So you actually download the whole Excel file, even if it's, you know, hundreds of megs large, and anything you want to do with it, you're doing there on your own local machine, right? You're not really relying much on the network except to grab that file in the first place. Okay? We understand the difference between thin and thick clients and applications. Questions on that? Okay. So, usage. In practice, most systems are either going to be thin clients running thin applications, because if you have thin clients, you're not going to be able to use them to run thick applications anyway, so that makes sense. And a lot of uh, you know, mobile devices are often considered pretty much thin clients for this purpose or thick clients running thick applications. So you might have a lot of desktops to you know, run all these applications more or less independently from the network. So if you're gonna pay for thick clients, you know, that the only reason why you would pay that extra is so you can run the thick applications, mean, means less load on your network, right? Thin clients, they're gonna be generally cheaper machines, but you're gonna have more network traffic because everything you do is gonna be a back and forth with the application server. A thick client, you pay more for the machine up front, but there's probably going to be less traffic on your network. Okay? That's the trade-off. Okay. Questions on any of this stuff we covered? Thin versus thick, cloud servers, cloud servers, cloud caching, da-da-da. Nothing? All right. We'll see you all on Friday.